Hi, I'm Alan Ross. I'm the managing editor of APC Media and APC Technologies. We are at the CGRE 2023 Grid of the Future Symposium. And these interviews are with the leaders uh, at CGRE and the leaders of the industry. Hope you enjoy. My next guest is James Amato. James is the vice president with Burns and McDonald. Right, sir. Um, is there a title behind vice president? Is like vice president of, of you know, I, I wish there were, I wish there were, but I've got a few hats that I wear with the company. So, uh, part of my responsibilities is essentially being the chief commercial officer of our T and D grid. Under that has got various responsibilities, everything from running our strategy and development of our international business, which is comprised of the United States, Canada, UK, and now just getting into Mexico as well. Like you're, 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 you're nailing all of the English speaking until you said we're going to Mexico. Good for you. Yeah. yeah. Well, Mexico, Mexico is the greatest opportunity for America, probably our greatest opportunity for trade and for labor for the next quarter century or more moving okay. forward. So it's about time we all started looking at it that way. Okay. I'm going to ask you about that later because okay. that seems to be a passion of yours because you just brought it up. But first of all, how'd you get your double E right? Obviously. I am not a double A. So, but you're not an engineer. I'm not an engineer. Oh my God. Why am I interviewing you? <laughs> why are you interviewing? That's a good question. No, dude, why am I here? Your background. My background. So prior to joining Burns McDonald, um, I was in the wire and cable industry for the better part, about eight years to a decade or so. And in my life, I was one of those people who always under, like had an affinity for figuring out how things operated on the okay. technical side. So. I had erector sets. I had electrical kits. Well, you are an engineer. I wired my parents' house's new phone okay. system. So I knew how to tinker and I really understood how things work. My father was an attorney. I thought I was going to become an attorney. But took my whole time in college, I was going to become an attorney. And I decided I really didn't want to become an attorney because I think to become an attorney or a doctor, you really have to love what you're studying. And by hook or by crook, I had some friends of mine that I knew since I was young who were involved in the wired cable and data structured market industry. And they were really excited about the company they were going to work for at the time, and they got me to join. And it really turned me on because nothing in this world runs without wire cable, right? When you think about it, nothing does. And then you learn about how everything operates. And one of the things that I got put into by the company I joined immediately was uh, calling on large design build firms. So I was calling on everybody from Friends of McDonald to Latin Beach to Peewit, all the large yeah, and building corporations yeah. to come in the country. So I just really gravitated towards the power sector. And at that time, it was building a lot of power plants, not only in the US, but also in China and in Egypt and a few other countries as well. So it was a really great opportunity. Then after 9 11 hit, um, while there was a lot of posturing that we're going to build more power plants and, and really try to create an energy policy in America that's backed by some kind of reliable power. Stop. What I saw, though, was that a massive in investment in uh, power delivery, transmission lines, substations were really starting to hit and grow. And then I started learning about the power delivery market, which I really got a lot of excitement and juice out of. And I threw myself into that. And uh, KMV and the power delivery market has been my focus for the better part of the last 23, 24 years. Okay, so um, a, ba a background thing I found out and doing some research about you was uh, you created $13 billion, that that time was $13 billion with a B. With a B, almost, yeah. like, <laughs> almost like Carl Sagan, billions and billions, billions and billions <laughs> of dollars of work. You yeah. say that 13 times. Yeah, but, uh, talk about correct. Well, a um, few things. One, when I first got into uh, the transition distribution market, there was only one mega billion dollar scale, I would say, investment at the capital level was done by then Northeast Utilities, now Eversource. Yeah. It was called the Middletown Norwalk Program. And it also had the Glenbrook Cables Program attached to it as well. Uh, they might have had a third, but I am uh, Bethel Norwalk. So they had three projects that if you, if you added everything together, you were almost actually coming close to $2 billion. And it was after the Energy Policy Act of 2005, after we had the blackout of 2003, which most people probably remember. Right. And there was an incredible amount of incentives for utilities to invest in the infrastructure grid to make sure that if a tree falls over somewhere in the United States, it's not going to shut out 
a quarter of the country's power grid right. and try to make it more resilient and more reliable. So there was an incredible amount of money injected into the market at that time. We were the first, when I say we, Burns of McDowell, were the first firm to successfully complete a billion plus dollar scale project, largely because it hadn't been done on that scale in at least 25, 30 years. Okay. So after the success of that project, it was, it was a good calling card going down the utilities that had very low to reduce almost no staff, had very large capital spend that they had to invest in. They had a need for our expertise knowing how to successfully you know, run scope, schedule, and budget on, on large capital framework. And for us, that being successful on those first set of projects um, really enabled us to be able to bring value to the market that wasn't there before. And as we were able to get more projects, it just started cascading. And so um, that's kind of how it happened. And if you think about it, that's kind of what happens in markets. When, there is, when there's something that's a need that's not there, it usually comes. And when you bring that need to the market, and other people want it or have a need for it in this case, and there's not a lot of folks who are willing to do it, it was, it was easy for us to do. Because of the structural model of program management, you know, we're managing the spend, we're doing design, we're helping on the firm, and we're doing a lot of the functional areas of a of project. A lot of our competitors were more interested in taking on chunks, smaller chunks of the project where they would say design, build parts of it. And that's what they were interested in. They figured there's probably better for them. Um, from their perspective, how they want to go into the market. Yeah. So for us, we were able to also not only, you know, help our clients, but we also help manage a lot of our competitors as well. And in a market where there's been almost more demand than there is supply, especially in the last four years, and it's not changing anytime soon, um, it enabled us to create a niche in that market of capital spend that I'm really proud of. That's really, I mean, manage your competitors. Yeah. That's, a, that's an excellent that's a trust factor too, as you talk about it. Yeah. It is, but we have a small industry. Yeah. And right. the level of professionalism that I found in the energy market, whether on the on the client side, owner side, developer side, or even on the side of the competition, um, I'm really I'm really proud of how they carry ourselves. Especially for example, uh, we're here in Seagray, you know, U.S. National Committee, of which I'm a member. You know, we're comprised of all of our competitors in the market, along with our utility clients, and we're trying to find out new ways to help each other be better. Yeah. You know, I mean, and again, when there's scarcity, yeah, it's typically knives out no matter what market you're in. Yeah. But we haven't seen that, you know, in at least a quarter of a, of a century almost, arguably, yeah. in the TND space. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. So I'm going to lay out a, a scenario Good. and pick any part of the scenario because I'm I'm going to appeal to your engineering background because you've been in this long enough now. been in long enough. I could probably you could get, get yeah. I, uh, Al Capone State University degree, probably. <laughs> but you know. uh, in the old days, we generated massive generation. We transmitted through yeah. big pipelines. Right. Was, pipeline was scaled. And then we had the demand side and we kind of controlled that. And now we have a step everywhere, right? I mean, you got uh, distributed in your resources and the management of them. You got rate payers becoming consumers, becoming well, now prosumers electrification, transportation, we're trying to decarbonize, we're trying to decentralize, we're trying to diversify, pick another D and I'll come up with it. But we're trying to do all of these things kind of all at once. We're making the grid of the future, this conference that we're at, that's got to be hardened. It's got to be flexible. It's got to be reliable. It's got to be resilient. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, it's changing all the time. Correct. Pick something in there and say, where are the real challenge is going to be and and stay in the t and d side of it but if you wouldn't mind yeah what do you think the challenges sure. of the d side are going to be the challenges are going to be very similar on, on both sides the t and the d okay. um i mean i'll start with the technological side of it whether we're talking small scale storage or large scale storage that's a problem it's going to affect the d as well as it's going to affect the t right and without it, you're not going to be resilient and you're not going to be reliable. Right. And lithium is not the answer. Now, the cool thing is there's some really interesting technologies that are out there. And I'm a big half glass full person. I believe in ingenuity. I believe in the future. I believe in innovation. Nobody innovates better than we do here in the U.S. Nobody is also better at saying, hey, left side of the menu and the right side of the menu, like you just described in the U.S. So first is the technology of storage is a, is a, is a big issue that we need to deal with. The second bit is new resources. 
We had the largest amount of baby boomers retired last year, and there's still over 100,000 month coming off the rolls now. There's been a brain drain in our industry that's existed for decades. So we've got most consulting firms and utilities have new grads comprise the majority of their organizations. And they do not necessarily have all the people there with the expertise to know how to crack them and get them into shape and grow them up into in the running in the running cup, so to speak. So resources at a time of high demand that are in low supply is going to be something we're going to have to fight an answer to. Because you can't do everything you just you just listed there without enough resources to take it on. So resources are going to be the second biggest challenge that we're going to face. Um, what I do believe, though, that we're going to be able to take on, and really, if we can answer the problem of permitting, is we'll be able to get a lot more projects done to make the grid more resilient and more reliable and have power delivery, not only at the high voltage level, but actually also on the distribution level as well. If we, if we allow the utilities who are charged with a huge responsibility to provide reliable, sustainable power to people when they need it. And they're being, you're being held from being able to do it. I just saw that I, I'm dead. two days ago, Governor Newsom signed a bill to support all of this, you know, development of transmission in California, but vetoed a bill on making permitting more streamlined on a few projects, not on all of them, even a few. And while that is still going to be the name of the game, People get headlines with doing a whole lot of nothing, and it's going to have a net negative effect on the consumer. Yeah, I, and th and that's true of everything in transition. The uh, getting permitting quicker, especially California, they put a lot now a lot of states, but California uniquely, they are unique. The um, I was at the RE Fuss conference recently doing this, and three or two years ago, that conference we had. 12,500 people. Last year, we had 15,000. This year, we had 40,000. Why did it suddenly, all of a sudden, leaf up? Well, a lot of the emphasis was on storage. Now, suddenly, you saw storage and solar coming together like never before and saying, the solution is solar and storage. Now, they, there were a couple of things about hydrogen, right? I, I happen to be big on, I, I was consulted with a hydrogen monitoring company for a couple of years. So I learned more about you know, offshore wind making uh, hydrogen, storing it, that's power when you, when you need it. And it, and so there's a lot of change that's coming in this storage in right. Flow batteries, there's a vanadium, a vanadium battery. Well, vanadium is pretty plentiful, it's not lithium. Correct. It, but it's large scale and it's still really not economically capable of doing what you need to do. But the, the, the potential for change rests in the minds of the next generation exactly. and we're not really getting enough of them and so consequently uh, uh, well, what you're talking about kind of also lends itself to a burns and mcdonald and i'm not making an advertisement for you but not everybody can have in a in a nucleus what you guys can develop as a consulting firm so you you can see different people around the country around the world now as you talk about mexico you can say yeah, we can do that, and we can we can bring them up quicker. They just had to crack that nut and bring them up quicker, right? We decided to go and expand to the necessity and resources. Well, we realized for us to spend the kind of money and invest the way that we needed to, number one, it wasn't that much the much most people would think, so I don't know why other companies wouldn't spend the money necessary. We built uh, businesses in India where if you walk down the halls, they look no different than the offices here. Um, the quality of engineering is the same that we get here because we spent the time, we found the people. You really got to do the work. And right. a lot of people don't want to do the work that's necessary. Um, mentioning Mexico, yeah, they've got a very young labor force. We have a lot of older people and we've got our next generation, the Zoomers, there's not a lot of them, right? And I'm Gen X, there's not a lot of us. So it's going to take another decade or so for um, you know, the millennials to really hit their stride on where they're going to be in size and impact financially and in sheer numbers. Mexico already has the numbers. There we have the people, and so does so does India as well. Um, but there's certain economies like Western Europe, for example, they don't. Yeah, yeah. if you look, if yeah. you look, if you look, if you look at resources there, they're hurting and they're lacking badly. Canada, the North, only has about 36 million people, and in the energy sector, they think they've got zero percent unemployment. Yeah. So they're utilizing us to help make up the difference. So for us, being able to manage the demands and needs is going to be as 
as much as we can as a company while also protecting what we're about because we're hundred percent employee owned. Right. So we make money, we make money together. We lose money, we lose money together. It's not, it's not uh, some faceless person on Wall Street. So we try to take that very, 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 very uh, seriously. Two last questions. First one, you talked about Mexico. Yep. Uh, elaborate a little bit more on what you said we need to do now. We need to define who we is and what do we need to do now? When I say we, I'm talking about our the United States proper. Okay. Um, when you when you look at the challenges we currently have, not just in, in the energy space, but in manufacturing and our issues geopolitically, we've pulled back. We've got the lowest amount of troops globally right now we've ever had. Um, you can see that manufacturing is starting to come back. We no longer want to have everything over in China. So everything is coming back. Well, it's just not, a, it's not microwave popcorn. It's going to take a good six to 12 years to rebuild all the supply chains for all the industries from chip manufacturing. So all the things that people like to get at Walmart, um, blue light special or hey, Mark, you know, if you're old enough, like I am, all those things people took for granted have to be rebuilt here. So it's going to be a massive lift to not only answer the energy issue, but the energy demands for data centers, the energy demands for building new infrastructure and manufacturing. Yeah. And oh, by the way, we also have a lot of people that are going to need it, as well as um, partners that we can rely on to help us build what we need to, uh, which leads me back to Mexico. Well, if we're going to pick somebody that we want to work with, we need to have a country that is close by because they're on the southern border. We need to have a country that's got a very large number of young, skilled workforce. That's Mexico. Yeah, We need to have someone that we've got a historical relationship with that we can strengthen. That is also Mexico. And when you think about where the rest of the world is headed to, um, number one, I'm very bullish about where we're at. But to accomplish the transitions we're going to have to do with the least amount of bumps and the least amount of headaches at a time of high interest rates and high inflation that aren't going to go away very, for a very long time, we need to have the strongest, most reliable partners we can to help steward our way through it. I wish you were writing policy for what we should be doing at the federal and in industrial America. I have a, a friend who has uh, transformer plants here in Georgia and Virginia. Well, I'll name the company, but it was a transformer manufacturer in Virginia. He, he sold out, right? He needed yeah. to grow. He took over a, a failed facility, one transformer manufacturer in Chihuahua, Mexico, built-in labor force, excellent skilled labor force. He could bring it up quickly, excellent engineering capability right. within Mexico. Right. Uh, and they went into production within literally record time. And he's got engineers working on the shop floor to learn how to build transformers so that they can better engineer transformers. But yeah. Perfect example of how he almost doubled his capacity but it, in with, literally within two years, he, he, wouldn't, he would have been hampered to do it here for a lot of different reasons. The biggest one was the labor supply, but I couldn't right. agree with you more about it's on our southern border. I signed an agreement with a company I owned years ago in the furniture industry, a Megillodora project, mm. where we could transfer back and forth. And it was brilliant. I mean, it was really led to the uh, the North American Trade Act the, yeah. the agreement. The part that we did with Mexico it eventually turned into that, and it was very effective for a lot of industries. Lastly, sea grape. Yeah, the value to see where do you personally and to bring as a McDonald. So having been in the industry for a little over 20 years, I was, you know, there's other industry events um, that we could go to. I triple E is a good example of that. And, you know, about 10 years ago or so, 12 years ago, went to my first CRA conference and I was blown away at the emphasis on the technical. I mean, I, I tell people, it's Woodstock for engineers at, at every two years at the annual, at the annual, yeah. they all, but as an organization, I feel that same way as well. I mean, not, not to disparage other organizations. They all try to do very well. They all try to do a good job and they all specialize in different things. Some, some have more of a net impact on papers that lead to commercial sales of their country's products. Others are more focused on solving problems. Seagrade is about solving problems. What do engineers do? Engineers solve problems. So when I think about over 250 plus committees with a, a breadth and depth of topics of focus and innovation and technology, it's, it's second to none globally. Uh, it's a passionate group. Like I said, we've got five or six of my competitors and I sit on committees together trying to figure out how to make the world better, how to help our customers be better 
and our customers work in concert with us. It's a very unique organization. I'm incredibly proud of your heart. Excellent. James, thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Pleasure's mine.